checked every other place we have checked in with the world and we have not found satisfaction with our, for our souls some of us have attempted drinking and smoking and we have tried sex we have tried everything and we have not found satisfaction for our souls. And by your divine grace, you helped us to stumble into your presence. It was an orchestrating that is beyond human calculation. And suddenly we are beginning to find that this is the place that we have longed for. This is the place that we ought to. This is the place where we need to be in your presence. In your presence. In your presence. In your presence. And where I always want to be. When God began the work of creation and he made man, the Bible says he planted a garden in the east of Eden and he placed man there. And we read that the first abode of that living soul that God had created was in an atmosphere where God came in the cool of the day and, and fellowshiped with him. And that occurred until after the fall where man began to find a technology where it could live outside the presence of God. In fact, the Bible says, for Cain departed from the presence of God and he builded the city. Men have found residence. They have learned how to live outside the perimeters of the boundaries that God has given to us to live. And that is indeed in his presence. There is a scripture that tickles my fancy since yesterday that I've been ruminating over, just playing in my head as I was looking at the scriptures, and it is found in Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. If you are familiar with your Bible, you will know that Genesis chapter 8 is about the story of Noah. The rain had stopped falling. The ark 
had betted at Mount Ararat. And in verse 6, the Bible says, And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which, which went forth to and fro till the waters were dried up from off the earth. Verse 8. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. Verse 9 is my interest. It says, But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and put her in unto him into the ark. Many of us have become like the raving. We have found out a way to live outside the ark of God. Um, I read from the news recently that Cameroon is about to open their dam again, or have they opened it, and so there's going to be flooding in some, that's going to affect part of our region. And nine states in Nigeria has been implicated in that flooding. And Delta is one of them, and there's already an emergency or a large system that has been activated and the Delta State government has alerted the inhabitants of the coastal line to relocate. The import or the implication of those things to us as we consider this scripture is the fact that Life is full of troubles. In fact, somebody says that in life, it is either you are in trouble, you just left one, or you are heading towards one. The wisest man who once, who lived on the earth said that, okay, it's not the wisest man. I think that was Job that said that the days of a man were short and full of trouble. So there is always trouble. There's, since after the fall, since Adam circumvented the entire plan of God, man has been in trouble. It has been from one trouble to another. And once we consider flawed, we, we are drawn to something that is very significant in scriptures because Jesus Christ took off from that same tangent and said that his coming will be like the days of Noah. The second coming of Jesus is not something that is, is um, topical these days. It's not something that we Consider It's not something that is talked about. We have found preferences with things like prosperity, things like healing, things like being your best, your best, having your best life now. But as we look at the things that are surrounding us and our everyday life and the things that affect us, the Bible says that the eternal power of God are clearly seen. The things that are created, the things that are happening ought to teach us. We ought to sit down and draw lessons from them 
and you will see that God is speaking to us in, in diverse ways, only that we have lacked the ears or we are hard of hearing. You see, in the days of Noah, it had never rained before. There was nothing like rain. If my geography is correct, then they were in, quote and unquote, in a desert place. It was difficult to see a pool of water, not to talk about rain. And suddenly, you saw a man Start, started building what looked like a boat. What one would consider that is either this guy is out of his mind or something is terribly wrong. But the beginning of this whole conversation started with a, with a commentary in scripture. The Bible says, but Noah found grace. Noah found So it is with us in our world right now. There, there is a whole lot of activities. There are many things that are happening. And it is very much akin to the days of Noah. Just think about it. Just let your mind just do the comparison and you see that we are really like unto those days of Noah. Until he finished the ark and he entered himself and his family. And God commanded him to take two of every kind of the animals and he entered What is, what is um, of concern to me is that after they entered that act, the Bible says it was God that came to lock the door. So when the rain came and the people came to knock, even though Noah could have been compassionate, if Noah wanted them to, okay. But he didn't have the key. Probably the door was locked from outside. So they had entered, and so God locked the door and went to heaven. It reminds me seriously again of how often we hear these things and we do not pay attention. It's, it just comes to us as information. It just rules in our heads and it just passes. Jesus give the most graphic illustration of these things when he told us the story or the parable of the sower. But that is really not my concern. We're just driving slowly until the point where the water, rain had stopped, but there was water. When, when it rains, it takes time for water to to leave, is it not so? Right? And so, the ark was floating on water in a direction that he, that even Noah could not control. So it was not like there was a navigational system in that boat that he knew where he was going. That again, is very relevant to our season because we are in a season of great faith. 
Hmm? Faith is trusting God with the steering of your life and says, drive. Take me wherever you want to. But many of us are struggling with that steering with God. We are struggling. We want to determine the direction. But you see, faith and great faith is that which has wholly and totally surrendered the life. So Noah sent forth two birds. The first was a raven. Released it to the earth. And the raven found, even though there was water everywhere, eh? at least we know that the rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible did not tell us for how long they floated in a non-directional way. We, we do not know. But the waters that will have covered the mountains, eh? that we can just put a timeline on our own minds and know for how long they had been going on this face of the earth. The raven found a way not to return. And that really describes many of us with all the things that are happening around us, with all the things that are happening in the world, where it seems as though Nigeria is the nucleus of all the happenings, we have found a way like the raven not to find our way back to the earth. Again, he sent forth a dove. The Bible says that this dove flew around, but because he could not find a place of rest for her foot, he found herself back, her way back to the ark. And that really, truly should be us. Theophilus Sunday sang a song. He says, there's no glory in this world and there's no greatness here for me. But many of us have found a way to live in this world and so are comfortable with this world that we have forgotten that we are pilgrims, that we are supposed to live in tents. That was how Abraham lived. Though. This is our father of faith. Eh? The Bible says he lived in tents. He was a sojourner. The course of his life was that he was looking for a city who has its foundation and whose builder was God. That was all that he cared for. But many of us who claim to be children of Abraham have found comfort with this earth. I made a joke recently with some of my friends, and I, and I told them that when I was growing up, it was a sect of people that wanted to inherit the earth. But now, we, Christians, eh, we really want to inherit this earth more than those people now. If you call, if you talk to an average, average believer and ask them what their plans are. 
you will be shocked and surprised to know that there is no eternity in view in every plan that they have. Everything is about this earth. Everything. We have forgotten that we are strangers in this world. And one day, we will go home. One day we will go home. The Bible says that that dove, when he didn't find rest for its feet, he flew back to the ark. You know why? It's used to it. There is a place where we can run to and find rest for our souls. When we follow the hustle and bustle of life to a point and we cannot have rest, we have a place where we can go and recline and have rest for our souls. For some of us, we have places where we unwind, where we find this rest. How be it, it is not in the ark. It is not where we are designed to be. There is something that is interesting in that scripture because the Bible says that when the dove came back, what happened? The Bible says that Noah put forth his hands and pulled it in. You see, all we need to do really is to say, like the prodigal, I will arise and I will go back to my father. And he rehearsed the things that he, he wanted to see. I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven, I have sinned against earth, I have sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me one of your hired servants. He has rehearsed it. But the young man did not stop at the rehearsal point. He did not just stop at making a decision. He actually stood up, turned around, and like that dove, started to find its way home. And what interests me in that story is that the father was outside. You see that father? I imagined every day that son was away. He came out in the morning and stood outside and said, perhaps my son will come home today. Perhaps my son will come home today. And I can also imagine that that's how God does for many of us who are now wandering away like the raving. And we have not found our way home. He's just like, I wish this guy would just turn around. The Holy Ghost is sent and is winning our hearts. The Holy Spirit is, keep, is, is putting that subtle pressure and reminding you that this is not you. This is not what you are meant to be. This is not where you ought to be. This is not what you ought to be doing now. And all that is needed for us to do is just to 
get up, turn around, and start our way home, then you will realize that the Father has always been outside. Now, not just was he standing outside. The Bible says that it was the father that recognized the son a distance away. It was the same father that ran to meet the son. The Bible says Noah reached out his hand and pulled the, uh, the bird, the dove, back to himself. And he said, not just to himself, but into the ark. You know, Jesus Christ says, okay, not, the Bible says, it says, draw nigh to me. Eh? And I will draw nigh to you. So who has the initiative? Have you now learned to live outside the presence of God? It is a very bad state. It's a very bad state to live outside the presence of God. And you see, this thing is not a song. We sing, we like to sing it. Nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to be with you. Nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to be with you. It is not a song, God. It is a reality. It's a reality. When I started to my journey in pressing into the Lord. One of the stories that stuck my heart, that shook me to my foundations, was the story of a South African called Will McFarlane. The story had it that this man commanded so much of the presence of God that Will McFarlane was brought, he was an old man at this time. They just bring him to a meeting to sit down. If he sat down, then they were sure that the presence of God was there. The whole community, see, these were people who, if they pass by you, they don't need to talk, just high, and there is so much of the conviction of sin. There was so much holiness that exuded from the being. Physic, this is not spirit, this is human being, but... He so commanded the presence of God. So one day, when McFarlane was walking in the market square, and suddenly he fell. The story had it that the whole town stood still. People were confused. Should we... In fact, to even touch him was a problem. Nobody knew what was, what was, how to help him. So the community was gathered around this old man who had suddenly fell. And after a while, he dusted himself from the floor and assured them that he was fine, he was fine, he was fine, he was fine. So somebody was brave enough to ask him, Old man, what happened? Why did you fall? And his answer was the most shocking. You know what he said? He said, for the first time, I did not feel God around me, and I refused to take the next step. He fell deliberately. He did not feel God around him. 
And he fell. He says, I dare not take a step. When I heard that story, I made up my mind. See this thing, I will get it. I know you can take decisions about your life without recourse to these things that we are talking about. I know you have plans for your life. I know you want to be the greatest man who has ever lived. Those are good. But can you take that your plan and enter into this thing that we are talking and see whether it will survive? And I feel that many of us know that this plan will not survive. That is why we rather stay away and conduct our lives outside him. A young man wants to marry. A young woman wants to marry. This is a lifetime commitment. And they are comfortable to make that commitment outside God. Me, I fear for you. Because I know the implication of these things. To live a life outside God. See, these things are, they are as real as what you will become in life for the younger ones who are still in secondary school, who are, who are going to, to further into the university and do something with their lives. These things are as important as the choice of what you will read. These things are as important as the choice of what even school you will attend. You don't have a life lived outside the presence of God. It's a life that is guaranteed to fail. And like the story we are considering, there's water everywhere. There's wahala everywhere. The thing about the presence of God does not mean that when you are, when you are there, it means that all your problems have gone away. Please don't get me wrong. Eh? In my own experience, I found out that the time you are getting there is the time the wahalas, they, 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 it's like though somebody is stoking the fire. The day you decide to live your life according to this economy, eh? Let me just guarantee you that it is unadulterated hell. The devil and everything will come at you with force. But I also found something. Hmm? In the midst of the tempest, you can sleep. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Most of us end the day. But he said, he continued to say, and the God of peace No, you won't find peace in the world. I hope you know. Eh? What, did they, what did Jesus say you will find in the world? Eh? Troubles and tribulations. That, that is the world and his system. Oh. Say what he mean. You will find peace. It says, and the God of peace shall guard your heart 
and mind through Christ Jesus. So things are hard, but you can put a genuine smile on your face. And the cause of that smile is simply because you know that your father is in charge. It's just a matter of time. If he pleases to do it, it won't take him any second. These are the people who have found the technology of living in the ark. What about you? Are you like the dove or like the raven? That is the question I've come to ask you this morning. If we sit down with you and ask you about your life, you certainly will be classified into one of these as either a raven or as a dove. But I wish we would be like a dove. My heart is that as you hear these things, you would decide. And for many of us, may I say this, for many of us, this thing that we are talking about, not being in the presence of God, it has nothing to do with church. Oh. The presence of God is not church. You know, the children of Israel, they built church. Eh? And they worshiped there for 70 years. And God says, Me, I know who knows who I built church. Oh, that's it. You people are doing something, eh? Me, I'm not aware. Of. So there are many churches here in our time that God is not even aware of what is happening there. You, you, well, you people are doing something. Something. So it's not church. The Bible gave us a story of two sisters. One is called Martha. The other one, Mary. Martha was busy bee. And you see, it is, yes, you can be active and busy and doing things for God. Eh? But in all of this, if you do not find time to go back and sit down like that dove, so that he will draw you in and pull you in, you are just, you will be born out. Garant, garant, it is guaranteed you will be born out. So I want you to close your eyes, bow your heads and close your eyes. Which one are you? A dove or a raven? Ask yourself, what have you learned? Have you learned to maintain a consistent, intimate fellowship with God that you know how to steal away from the crowd, from the noise, from all the activities and recline to him? And like that disciple who Jesus loves, you can now put your head and rest on his bosom and have a tete-a-tete and just have this thing. If you call it spiritual romance, you are not wrong. And he can begin to whisper things to you and tell you things and bring you into a place 